Hello, good afternoon. Hope we all had a good lunch out there. Had a good th morning. Were we all in Schwern's keynote this morning? I hope. Is anybody not there? Because I'm going to reference that a lot because he touched on a lot of things that we're going to talk about here as well. Uh, sorry, my name is Andy Lester. Uh, <laughs> I've already cleared the room. And uh, I'm going to be talking about how newbies can get started contributing to open source. Who here considers themselves a newbie? Good. How many people, this is your first conference? You being here is contributing to open source. So thank you for being here. Uh, yes. How many old bees do we have in the room? How many people have contributed stuff to CPAN? Okay, this isn't at all for you, but the, but what I want to tell you is that for the new people, there's so much more to open source and the community around it that is more than just contributing code. Schwarn talked this morning about how so much of Perl is focused on writing code that goes on the CPAN, writing modules. And that's good because the CPAN is one of the jewels of Perl, but there's so much, much more than that. And I want you all to know, I want all the newbies to walk out here knowing that they can contribute somehow and wanting to contribute somehow. So I told my daughter what I was going to be talking about. I said, give me some art. And so this is her representation of it. And it's not, I, I kind of explained it, it. She doesn't understand software distribution. But that's her representation of me and my Apple. Um, but this kind of, this, this, the thought, the balloon down here, I'm not very good with computers. Change that to, I'm not very good with programming. And you have the problem that so many people have. They say, well, you know, I, I, there's all these amazing tools out there. There's Moose and Catalyst and DBIX Class and Dancer and so much that's out there. And it can feel daunting, like, well, I'm not a rock star programmer. I'm not a genius programmer. I can't contribute. And that's not true at all. So the idea of I'm not very good with computers, and we've probably all heard you know, our, our, our Uncle Dave tell us that, well, I'm not very good with computers. Can you come over and fix my internet? We all have a lot of amazing skills that we can contribute, and I want you all to please help contribute to my open source. So my first rule that I want everyone to remember is that you are worthy of contributing. A lot of times we can have kind of a rock star sort of uh, mentality where we say, oh, isn't Larry amazing? Or isn't you know, isn't Ricardo, Ricardo Cygnus an amazing guy? And we, we kind of have these luminaries. But that's just them. There are so many other people in Pearl that contribute to that. And you are worthy of being those people. Also, those people didn't start out as rock stars. Larry did not start out as a rock star. Larry started out just being some guy working at JPL. And over time, the things that he did have been amazingly important contributions, both to Perl, but in computing in general. So what's the first question that most people ask when I talk to them about open source, about this sort of idea of contributing? Anyone? Is it difficult? Is it difficult? Ooh, that's kind of a good one. No, that's not normally what I get. And I see this posted on mailing lists or on Reddit a lot in slash r slash open source. Yes, what should I work on? What is a good project to work on? And the answer to that is, anyone want to suggest? The best project to help on is one that you actually use right now. Open source is all about scratching an itch. And a lot of people feel like that that they should say, oh, well, I'm going to find a project that needs me. But really, you want to find a project that you need and that you can easily contribute to. And then the second best is one that you want to use, something that actually is interesting to you. 
So there's, there's no one way to answer what that answer is, uh, because it's different for everybody. There's a wonderful site. I don't have a slide for it because I didn't think of it until just at lunch. There's a wonderful site called openhatch.org. And it is, uh, it, it aims to match up projects with things that need to get done and people who are interested in them. And I've been talking to them, and I'd really like to help them get going. Because once you find out a project that you're interested in, they're aiming to, they, they want to help match up skill sets. So go take a look at them. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that I think is going to come out of that. Openhatch.org. Am I right on that URL? Okay. This talk, I have another website that I'm working on that is going to be basically an expanded version of this talk that is more general, that is kind of going to go along with Openhatch. Uh, I don't have that ready for announcement yet, and it looks like crap, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. 89starts.com, but don't, don't hold it against me. So the first thing you do when you find a community or project that, you wanna, that you're interested in contributing into is you want to listen and learn. You want to understand what the community is that you're, that you're trying to help out with. Because we think about code. We think about code all the time. Oh, I'll just go look in the bug queue and I'll go fix some bugs. But you have to understand how that community works. Um, there, there are all kinds of different ways to, to, that the community works, and you need to grok that before you go barging in saying, hey, I'm going to do all this stuff for you. The enthusiasm is good, but it can set you off on the wrong foot. On the one hand, you have, some, you have a project like PUGS, which was the uh, Perl 6 implementation in Haskell. And Audrey said, anybody want to commit bit, just email me. And commit bits went everywhere, and everybody could commit to the project. Everybody know what I mean by commit bit? Anybody not know that? On the flip side, you have a project like Postgres which is extremely regimented, which has very well-defined processes about how patches are, what, exactly what patches have to look like, uh, the review process that goes through patch, that patches have to go through before they're accepted. They're very rigorous, which when you're dealing with my database, yeah, I want that. So, but, but a different project like a wiki or a website of one of mine like bobbytables.com, which is about SQL injection. I have that where anybody can just mail me a, a patch request on GitHub. I have the source for the website online, and yeah, okay, just send it to me and I'll, and I'll publish it. So understand how the dynamic is, what the social dynamic is, and how things actually happen. Um, the other thing is what does the project value is, is, is kind of consider Consider what the community finds important. It, does it value speed over accuracy? Does it, you know, do they want to release often or are they very regimented? So how do you listen and learn? Well, you can join a mailing list, read blogs of followers, join IRC, go to user group meetings. Those are the biggies that come off the top of my head. Um, the mailing list, many projects, most develop, uh, the development will center on a mailing list. Uh, Noreen this morning was talking about how in Apache projects, if it doesn't happen on a mailing list, it doesn't exist. But different projects do things differently. I know that, for instance, the Catalyst in, uh, projects uh, are, mo most of the development there is done in IRC. And so different projects communicate different ways. Um, reading the blogs of the leaders of the project can be very informative and give you a feeling for what you're getting into. Uh, there'll be a lot of technical information, typically, but you'll also get a feel for 
who the people are, who the players are in the project. So remember, and just remember, every project does this differently. What works in one place isn't going to work everywhere. So stepping back, spending a day or two or a week just listening will help you get into the project and will help you find out what is important to the project and what they need. Stealing from this morning, um, this, the, a lot of times, this is from Shorn this morning, a lot of times it feels like everything is about code. It feels like, because really that's, that's like our deliverable. Hey, look, I have a tarball. I want to contribute to that tarball. And so we think in terms of code, 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 code. But the code is almost a byproduct. It is the deliverable, but there are so many other things that go into feeding that. So the rest of this, I'm going to be talking about specific things you can do to help out the project. Any questions so far? Any, co any questions, comments? Stop me if you need to. Somebody ask me something so I can take a drink. No? OK. Number one thing you can do as somebody coming in, trying to help out, is dealing with bugs, dealing with bug management. And bug management doesn't necessarily mean fixing. Every project has some sort of bug tracking system, whether it's in GitHub or it's in RT, in rt.cpan.org or whatever. Bugs are the things, are the tickets, are the things that fall by the wayside as work gets done. Because the people who are the kind of the, the Captain Kirks of the project running forward and adding features leave the bugs behind. And maybe a bug will get fixed and we won't even know it. So how can we help with bug management? And when I say bug, that also includes things like uh, uh, feature additions as well. The number one thing you can do as far as bug management is actually report a bug. How many of us fess up, we see a bug, we figure out a way to work around it, and then never tell anyone about it? We say, oh, well, gee, the syntax highlighting, you know, oh, gee, the, the syntax highlighting for, such and, for Perl in Vim doesn't work if I have a percent at the, as the first line in the column, so I'll just indent it a space. And I'll get around it, and I move on, and I just live with it. I live with the broken window. We all know the theory of broken windows, that if you're in a neighborhood, that if you can leave a parked car for weeks on the street and nobody will touch it. But if you break a window on that car, within hours the thing is stripped. Because people see one sign of neglect as seeing that is worthless. And so it's the same thing. We say, oh, well, it's a bug. We'll just pass it by. Reporting these bugs is important because, one, people don't know about it. It can't get fixed unless you know about it. And I'm sure we've all yelled at our users, why didn't you tell me about this? Well, we follow the same rules. We have to live by the same rules on the projects we work on. So if you're going to yell at, if you're going to, go yell at the person over on accounting who didn't tell you that this has been failing for three weeks, you have the same responsibility to report the problem with your tools, the modules that you're using. Second, enhance an existing bug report. A bug ticket is not a static document. A bug ticket is something that is going to evolve over time. Uh, one of the things that I think is so beautiful about the way GitHub's issue tracker works is that it is so but simple to add comments and, and notations and links to the, the issue on, in the issue tracking system. So anything you can do to add information to that ticket is a win. So, yes? Uh huh. Fail, that, wouldn't that be like the very best? 
Yeah, sure. The best would be the best thing would be look. I've isolated this problem to exactly this, exactly this, and here's the test case I wrote that that tests it. But if you can't do that, that doesn't mean it's not worth reporting. And we'll talk. We'll get to that in a little bit. So, for instance. You might go look at the bug queue and say, okay, well, here's a bug queue that is kind of vague, or a bug that is kind of vague. Oh, well, here's a problem that we have with this piece of code. Go in and try it yourself. Oh, gee, okay, well, you've reported it on Linux. I'm going to go test it on Mac OS X. Here is what I've found. All of these are little bits of information that add to the greater whole of knowledge about how to fix that bug. We've all had that prop we've all had those cases where we've been fixing a bug and all of a sudden you turn over one little rock and you go, aha, that's the problem. Well maybe in this case, the fact that it at, it fails with a different error message on OS ten will be the rock that you've overturned for somebody else. All of these little things that we contribute are what I like to call stitches. Like if you're if you're putting together a quilt or a large, but well, let's just say a quilt, everybody can add a stitch to the quilt, and it adds to the greater whole. You don't have to understand the whole quilt, but just that one little stitch that you make adds to the strength of everything. And we, when you sit here and you're doing that, if if you were actually stitching on a quilt, you wouldn't say, well, this these stitches don't count. These aren't important, so I'm not going to do them. All these little things add up. The barrier, I want, I want everybody to realize that the barrier to entry to helping out on projects is very, very low, if you see it the right way. OK, another thing you can do is try to isolate a bug, which is like what you were saying. I was not able to have this happen under Firefox, but it does under Firefox 9 and Safari 2.4. Maybe you have ideas. Submit that idea as well. Add this to the add this to the existing ticket. How long do I have? I just real like till ten after. Okay, I'll just do all afternoon. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so again, we can talk about isolating the bugs. Uh, one of the things that kind of that can be put off, put, put offing, that can put off the authors or the people who are working on the project is if you come in and if, if you're going to provide information, provide information that you know is true. But don't say things like, oh, this happens in all cases. And this applies to bug reporting in general. Don't say, oh, well, this, ha this fails on everything I've tried or this fails on every template that the project ships with. Well, did you actually try every template, or did you abstract out that these four that you tried apply to all 100? A lot of this is just good bug reporting in general, but it's especially important when you're dealing with a remote bug tracking system, somebody who may, on the other side of the world, not be able to just walk over to your cube and say, tell me more about this. So the, the importance of good documentation for your code and for what you've done is amplified even more when you're dealing with bug tracks, bug, bug tracking. If you can write a test, that's huge. Um, we all, all, all of our Perl modules, we, we've all, we all, we all in, uh, I hope we've all installed Perl modules. And when you install the module, it runs an entire test suite to make sure that it works okay on your system. There aren't always enough tests in the module distribution, and it's I can't think of any project that wouldn't welcome more tests to validate that things install correctly. So the the power I mean, and we have such a good testing culture in Perl. We've pretty much driven a lot of test-driven development in the rest of the industry. It, and people look at us and go, wow, that's really great. Compare that with PHP, where they ship PHP distributions with known failing tests. 
you know, they had a security bug that went out a couple months ago that a test caught, and they didn't care because it had been crying wolf for months and months and months. So they never noticed the failing test. The power of tests to actually uncover bugs is huge, and we at we in Perl are really good at it. So if you can add another test to the test suite, that's a big win. Yes. I did the uh, testing workshop the last couple of days. Uh huh. Who taught that? Uh, the board. Okay. Uh, good. Good. Yes. And so you can you can check out a module and you can say which of the mo which portions of the module are actually covered by the test. Right. And if you say I want to fix this module, you can say, Oh look, here's some parts that aren't covered. And right. For the back of, for the back of the room, he's talking about devel colon colon cover, which is a code coverage tool. And what that does is, it, for those who haven't seen it, it devel cover runs the test suite that for the module, and then it gives you a beautiful HTML map of all the lines of code and all the lines of code that have been tested in the test suite. And if you don't have something tested by the test suite, you say, oh, well, gee, probably, you know, this function is never exercised by the test suite, so it might fail and we would never know it. And so devel cover is a great way to do that, yes, definitely. Um, for those of you who are working on projects that aren't C, that aren't just Perl, that are, you know, on things that are in C, for instance, compiler warnings, every time you have a compiler warning, the compiler is crying wolf. And we don't want to emulate the, the PHP mentality of, oh, it's just, uh, it's just noise, we don't care. Ideally, everything passes and doesn't ship until everything is all clean. And compiler warnings work against that. So if you can, if you see a compiler warning, or, ha or even worse in Perl, an actual warning from use warnings or strict, then go and figure out why that is. Silence that warning. Make sure that it's not actually warning you about something important. And quiet that wolf cry right there. Yeah. Oh, this is a stretch. Okay. Close the ticket. As tickets get left behind, they don't get closed. So, some, so there may be, say, three duplicate copies of the same bug in the bug tracker. And one of them gets closed when the thing gets closed, but the rest get left behind. Going through and verifying that tickets are actually still relevant, are still, uh, are still failing, is a great way that you can help silence some of that noise and diminish the load of, of bug tracking on the project team. Okay, enough of tickets. Um, let's talk about documentation. Who here has seen a project that doesn't need better documentation? Not so many hands go up. What? MPM. I don't know what NPM is, but uh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> every document, every project can probably use better documentation or more documentation. Perl, especially, we 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 want so badly to download something and try this module and see if it works. And so many times, modules are out there that don't let us do that that don't give us simple ways to test things out, that don't give meaningful examples. So if, you can, if you've actually gone through the trouble of working with a module that hasn't given you the, the easy examples, the easy on-ramp to using it, take your pain, take your couple of hours of pain in figuring out how the parameters actually work, and turn that into an example that you can feed back to the project. Uh, another way that a lot of projects stink at documentation for tutorials or, you know, get started in five minutes is that they use kind of abstract examples. And they don't use real examples. I would far rather have a module that explains, that gives real examples of 
of you know user and salary or whatever rather than field one, field two, field three. The, and the more concrete the example, the better. Uh, if you can document the process, uh, a couple of years ago, Perl 5 had a real problem with nobody, with, with the release process of a Perl 5 release being black magic and voodoo. And finally, they, they sat down, there were about 30 of these core people on P5P who sat down and said, look, we just need to document this so that it's not bus sensitive knowledge. So that if, if uh, Jesse Vincent or Ricardo gets hit by a bus, we still know how to actually release Perl. That kind of, of knowledge, never heard bus sensitive before or truck sensitive? <laughs> so yeah, or you'll hear sometimes you'll hear people talk about the truck number, right? I have a truck number of of two months because if I died, if I got hit by a truck, it would take two months to figure out what it is that I do for the company. Anyway, there shouldn't be any bus sensitive knowledge out there, and maybe what you do is help document what it is that's going on around you. Uh, it's another one of those things where it's listening to what people have to say. Yes? I think of a similar term as tribal knowledge that I heard last year. Right. Mike mm -hmm. like right. That bus sensitive knowledge is tribal knowledge. And it, people understand it as a group, but as people leave, that's lost. And transferring that information to new people who come in is very expensive and inefficient. And it sucks and nobody likes to do it. I think of it as implicit to explicit. Right. <laughs> Some things you can do that have absolutely nothing to do with programming at all. So many websites are out there, so many project websites are out there that have old, dead, out-of-date information on them. Or you'll see a website where they'll say, oh, okay, well, this project, somebody's giving a talk about this project at some conference in 2006. And it's just old, clunky crap that nobody wants to read, and the real stuff that they want to read isn't there. You're a user, as a user of the project, of the website, you know what you want to see. And if you've cursed at the website for the project, chances are somebody else has as well. And that's a great way you can do that. OK, next question. How many people here are not, how many people are here from the United States? How many of you realize that there are people who speak languages other than English? Because I don't think many of us do, and one of the best ways you can help is to translate something because so many projects have documentation that are only in English and Liz can I get an amen on this on on projects that don't that only deal in English I mean how do you how do you deal with that well okay <laughs> Your, yours is yeah <laughs> yours is but everybody else in dot nl doesn't have that luxury do they do they? Okay, well, forget it. I, I, I didn't talk to you. <laughs> okay, so, you know, is that, can I get an amen on the German stuff? Okay. All right, well, we Americans have taken over the world. What I wanted to. <laughs> okay. Oops, hold on. Yes. Okay. Many of the French people that I know are speaking English horribly. Okay. No, they don't want to. So here so here so here I've got this website called bobbytables.com. We all know this XKCD cartoon, I hope about SQL injection. 
So I started this website called bobbytables.com, which tells you how to properly avoid SQL injection. Right, so here's how you do it in Perl, here's how you do it in Delphi, et cetera. And then somebody came along and said, that's really awesome. I would like to do that in German. Took all the same stuff, took all my content, translated it. So now everybody who is in, and, and thank God, wrote the translation infrastructure. Because I don't know squat about the locale colon colon whatever namespace. And those kinds of translation things make me cry. And as an ugly American, I don't know anything other than solo un poquito de español. So um, went and translated all this stuff to German. Then this Andre guy came along and said, oh, I'd like to do that for Russian. OK, so he came along. And here's all the Russian translation as well. You want to know how to do? Uh, proper SQL binds. Well, some of it's not quite done, but he went and did all this translation. He didn't have to write it. He just had to translate it. And that kind, of, that kind of way of taking existing knowledge and putting it into something that's more accessible can be a huge win. And there isn't nearly enough of that going on out in open source. So if you are multilingual, and if you are fluently multilingual, and you can do this kind of stuff, that's a great win. And I'd love to see more people do that. Has anybody done any kind of translation stuff like this? OK. Uh, where's my cursor? There we go. OK, and some of the things we can do are just community, are just talking about things. Um, OK, how, how many people knew who I was before I walked in here? OK, I am not a rock star programmer. I'm not a great programmer. I'm a good programmer, and I've written stuff. But the thing that I've done that makes it so that you know about the stuff that I wrote is I talk about it. And as programmers, we kind of have this reflexive talking about things you work on is bad kind of mentality, and I've never understood it. But people see it as you're bragging or you're self-promoting or you know, you're know you trying to get hits on your blog. Like, who really gives a damn if you get hits on your blog? Especially in, in Illinois where Amazon, uh, the Amazon kickback program is no longer legal. But People, the affiliate program, that's what I was thinking of. Anyway, we, we sit here and we try, it, it's like we're afraid of talking about the things that we've worked on. And I think that's crap. So I want people to talk more. I want people to tweet more. I want people to blog more. If you see something, we're all on Twitter, right? Most of us on Twitter. Do we at least follow Twitter feeds? Okay, show of hands. Who is on Twitter? Maybe I'm overstating the reach of, of Twitter. You are. Okay. Well, whether you tweet it or whether you write a blog post about it, writing this stuff to let people know about it is important. Talking about how things work, or uh, talking about the cool things you've seen, talking about the communities that you're part of is part of expanding that community. If all we do is just talk amongst ourselves, we don't bring anybody else in. The only way you find out about, you know, how, when, when you find out about a cool new module, is it because you went and searched CPAN for it, or is it because somebody told you about it? That C, that, and that mechanism of talking to people and telling about it is an important part of what we do. And if that's your own project, that's okay. I just promoted bobbytables.com. How many of you had heard of that before? How many of you hadn't and said, oh, that's kind of cool? Because nobody had told you about it. And that's what we have to do. There's nothing wrong. I'm not a jerk about it. I'm not making money about it. Just say, hey, here's a cool thing that you might find useful. 
So writing blog posts is huge because it tells people about what the project actually is. If you write something about how I, I, I use this to, I use www mechanize to go and automate fetching information from my bank and dumping it into an RSS feed for me, myself. That gives a way for people to understand how to use a given project. It's kind of like writing that, that example tutorial that isn't in the documentation, except you've put it out on the web. You write about what worked, what didn't work. Hey, here's a problem that I ran into using this module. And after I debugged it, I went and I say, and I, um, here's how I worked around it. Documenting that is crucial, because otherwise we have this. And I think we've all been there, Googling for some error message. And it's on some it's on some online forum, and you never get the answer. And you're like, oh dear God, please, maybe I can mail this guy, and it comes back with a bounce. And you go, oh no, I'm never going to see him again. The only reason that googling for stuff on the internet to find answers is because people put it out there. It is your job to put that stuff out there for the good of everybody. There's also a huge benefit in writing a blog post, writing a blog regularly, that is very selfish. And that is, when you go for a job interview for your next job, that blog is proof that you know what you're talking about. One of the things, as it, it, part of my other life is I wrote a book about job hunting. And one of the things I suggest is that you bring in a portfolio of your work. Because if I have candidate A and candidate B, and they both look good on paper and they both interview the same, but I can see candidate B's code that they've written, candidate B is the safer choice. Because candidate B has something that I can look at and say, okay, this person actually knows what she's talking about. Short of, ha and, and writing a blog post, if you can sit here and write a, a blog post every two weeks. At the end of a year, you have 25 posts of, on technical information. You've written 25 things that talk about what it is that you know how to do, what your day-to-day -day job is like. And when the time comes that you actually have to go and go to your next job interview, that that's something that people can look at and get a sense of actually who you are, and that you're not just making up the things that you're talking about. Because as a job, as a hiring manager, anybody can come in and go, oh yeah, I know Pearl, yeah. I use Pearl 5.16, which he knows because he went to Pearl.org to see what the latest version is. Uh, right, <laughs> yes, <laughs> in all caps. <laughs> so anything you can do to, to, to help verify that is a win for you. Okay, go to a user group meeting or come to a, come to a YAPSI. Hey, here you are. Just being here and talking to other people is a win. If I wasn't, if I had any, if I lacked any sense of shame about corniness, I would have you all shake hands with the person next to each other, like we're in church or something. But group say what? Group <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm not that crazy. So, <laughs> but talking to all these people, they're uh, talking to just the hallway track, talking to other people in the community, talking to the person who you happen to be sitting next to in a talk, that's part of growing the community. It's a very small, it's a stitch, it's a small stitch, but it still adds to everything. Um, test a beta or a release candidate. This is huge. When and and if you see Ricardo Cygnus in the hall, is Ricardo still the pump king right now, or Jesse Vincent, or anybody? You c they will attest to the importance of you downloading and testing a beta version of Perl. But that applies to any software. 
if somebody says, if you're on a mailing, one of these mailing lists and they say, hey, look, we put out a beta version, will you please try it out? Spend a half hour, hour putting that through its paces. Say, hey, look, does all my code still work if I'm using this new version of Perl? And then give that feedback because it's so much more, it, 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 it's so much better to find those things out before the release than after. And that's why they put release candidates out there. Uh, answer a question. You're on a mailing list, you're at a user group, answer somebody's question. Try to help them out. That people don't, and don't leave it to somebody else. Don't say, oh, somebody else will answer that. Well, maybe nobody will. Draw a logo. And, and this is kind of a stand in for everything, for everything else that's related to graphic design. I can't write, I can't do any graphic design at all. Okay, my, all my web pages that I draw from scratch are in Times Roman black and white. And if I had use H1 tags, I'm happy. That's not where my strengths lie. So I rely on other people to do my web design for me on my project. So if you go to betterthangrep.com, which is a project website of mine, it looks all beautiful and pretty and I didn't do a thing with it because I don't, I can't do any of that pretty pretty. Welcome a newcomer. All of you, welcome to all of you. But if you see somebody who hasn't been here before, whether if here is a user group, if here is an IRC channel or a mailing list, your local Perl Mongers mailing list. Somebody says, oh, hey, I just signed up. Say, hi, what do you do? How are you using Perl? How are you using this? Letting them know that they're welcome. One of the things Schwern said this morning that I love is that we need to optimize, I don't have the quote right, but we need to optimize our communities for the people that want to use Perl. Right now, our communities are optimized for the people who already do. But if we want people to join, we need to think in terms of what outsiders want coming in. Uh, if you can talk at a user group, that's even better. That's fantastic. There's no user group anywhere in the world that doesn't every month have to say, please, somebody give a talk. Your talk doesn't have to be amazing. You don't have to be a rock star. You don't have to be Damian Conway and come here and do 45 minutes of, of insane brilliance, you could do 10 minutes of, hey, here's some stuff that I wrote using DBIX class and some problems I had. Anybody here doing a lightning talk here at Yapsi that has never done one before? Are they still open? Is Jeff still taking stuff? Lightning talks are a fantastic way to, to get your foot to actually say something. A lightning talk is five minutes on some topic. You don't even need slides. So, you know, maybe you sit here and you say, you do five minutes on comparing DBIX class with some other ORM, and here's what I liked about this and that, and that's it. And you do your five minutes and you're done. But that's huge. Because if we don't have people standing up here doing this, you don't know it. Um, finally, do what needs to get done. And this is kind of a catch-all. This is part of listening. On the Parrot project, Parrot's the VM that, that Perl 6 is being built on, uh, we had a problem where they were using the track database. It had, it had years of tickets in track. And Parrot had moved all the, all the source code repository over to GitHub and wanted to use the GitHub issues. And there's an argument on the mailing list back and forth about, well, you know, we should still use track for the issue tracking. No, GitHub is the way to do it. No, track, and because there isn't an automated way to move those things over, if we use GitHub for our issue tracking, which would be better, we're going to throw away all that history. And there's this back and forth and a couple of days, and it kind of got heated. And I kind of was just vaguely aware of this on the mailing list, and I said, what if I did the conversion of the tickets? I know a language that does text manipulation. What if I did it? 
And so here's a module. I look on the CPAN and hey, there's a module that reads tickets out of track. And then there's a Git API where you can post things into GitHub. So I wrote some code that read here, did the massaging and dumped it over into GitHub. I can't tell you how, how happy people were that somebody actually did that. That somebody took the time to do what is really scut work, right? But it's what needed to be done. Now, I'm not, I'm not a big brain on things like Parrot and virtual machines and dealing with, with garbage collection methodologies. I don't know any of that crap, but you know what? I can massage data real good. And I did, and that was huge. And if I hadn't been listening to it, if I hadn't been listening to the mailing list, I wouldn't have said, hey, here's something that needed to be done, because nobody even considered that somebody would want to do that shit work. But I did it. And that might include things like, you know, uh, that, that could mean cleaning up after a user group meeting. That could mean, uh, you know, oh, look, here, we, we need to convert spaces to tabs and re-indent all of this code to match our new code styles. Well, nobody wants to do that, but maybe you want, maybe that's something you can do, and that can get your foot in the door, and that can help you out. So just do it. Just do what needs to get done, and listen for those opportunities. Finally, thank somebody. You are here with all these people around you who are all awesome. All of you for coming here are awesome. Some of us have contributed software that you use every day, that your jobs depend on. Some of you just came and talked, or, or you, know, you chatted over something at lunch. All of these things are all the stitches that I'm talking about. We need to be grateful for that. We need to tell people that we're grateful for these things. Especially, and, and as somebody who works on projects and hears a lot of crap most of the time, getting an email out of the blue that says, hey, I use ACK, I really like it, it makes my life easier, that's huge. That's payment for me. Because nobody else is paying me. I'm not getting dollars for the things that I do. Spending two minutes to sit here, crank out an email to the author of somebody that was useful ha is, is very meaningful to them. And so please just think in terms of thanking people. And so I want to thank you for listening. My slides will be up here at, uh, up on speaker deck. Any other questions, anything for, so we got two minutes left. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. That, yeah, the, the, new, the, the eyes of a newbie coming in and looking at documentation, identifying the problems in documentation or API are indispensable. So that, and that's something that only a newbie coming in can provide. So you're in a unique position to help out projects that, you, that nobody else can in that same way. I'm sorry? Yeah, and it quickly goes away. Yeah, it'll get fixed. So, any other comments, questions? Okay, well, thank you for coming, and have a good rest of the Yapsie.